Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Electricity and ESCOM continue to dominate the headlines. Terence Kuma joins me to discuss the system outlook, as well as what is and isn't being done to improve that outlook. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Load shedding continues to present a real danger. Yes, we've had another fairly intensive week of load shedding after a terrible period. Uh, we've had the most um, intensive load shedding year, as we know, and that comes after 2020 being a very bad year and 2019. So we're on a, a really bad sort of trajectory with, with regard to load shedding and in particular the, the performance of the coal fleet, Eskom's coal fleet, the energy availability factors really fallen quite dramatically and there was a view that we could improve this over an, sort of an 18 month period by doing the maintenance that was that was neglected for many years and catching that up. Uh, that had been delayed, there had been procurement issues, there was COVID, uh, there's been um, financial constraints and I think that's a key thing that the money isn't really available to one get, the, you know, you need to plan, get the spares and you need to have that money already booked and in the system so that you can do all that. Uh, and it takes about a 24 months to do a major outage. You need that sort of leeway. So it was probably always overly ambitious to think that the maintenance would start uh, giving us the sort of reliability that the plants needed, that South Africa needed. Uh, um, and we need a longer time to do that. Um, so we are in a very precarious position that has become more precarious, I think. Uh, we know there's this toxic environment around uh, Eskim, um, former um, uh, employees that are still dissatisfied, that still seem to want to have skin in the game in some ways. There seems to be, obviously, when you've got this high level of um, spotlight on Eskim and negative spotlight, there's probably staff morale issues. But more than that, there seem to be active um, sabotage now in the system. For the first time, Eskim's shown a, a very clear incident of sabotage which happened around, in and around the Lataba power station where uh, cable stays to a, a tower were cut, purposefully cut, pushed onto the redundant power line so that that really brought down the power to the coal conveyor at Lataba which has been Eskom's best performing coal power station over the last uh, number of months. And uh, have they not found a backup? Uh, so this was supposed to be the redundant line was also hit, so that went down. If they had not found it back up, there would have been another over 3,000 megawatts out of the system on Wednesday night when we were already having stage two load shedding. So that would have taken us up to about stage six load shedding if they hadn't found a way to get that con coal conveyor powered, but they did. So there's that and there's an incident that looks very suspicious as well at Matimba on the same day. So this was a week that I think Eskom was hoping to be a bit more in a stable setup. Uh, they weren't, the number of trips, but then these additional incidents that look highly suspicious. The leadership of Eskom is under intense pressure. Is it doing enough? Well, I think uh, the point that I made about that 18 month window that they gave themselves to sort of bring some st stability to the coal fleet, I think that uh, is a blot against their copybook. I think. That, that promise well, was overly ambitious given the state of the coal fleet. So I think uh, they've put some of the pressure on themselves and I think they would also re recognise that. But on the whole, we have to recognise they've come in on the back foot. I mean, uh, there was almost a, uh, a, a tacit rec recognition by the new finance minister that previous management weren't allowed to load shed. I mean, that's a hell of a, <laughs> uh, a thing to say in the public domain, which means that basically maintenance had to slip if you're being told to keep the lights on and that if the new leadership was given leeway to load shed and others weren't, well then that means that the other management just couldn't do the maintenance uh, that, uh, that was required. And therefore we've got a plant that's even in a more precarious state than it would have been had there not been such a, a directive. So I think they come in on the back foot I think they also come in with a lot of other pressures that they're having to do, the restructuring of Eskom. That's a large piece of work that has to uh, take place and is urgent. And a lot of management time has to go into that. They come in on, with a huge uh, state capture and 
corruption legacy that has to be dealt with. That's not. That's also requires focus, management time. Again, that's difficult to overcome immediately. And you can see with the sabotage, it seems to suggest that some of this remains in the system, uh, not outside of the system. So that has to be, uh, so then there's this whole focus on security that requires management time and attention again. And then there's the financial overhang, which is which really, really uh, weighs down everything. It weighs down whether you've got money to plan for maintenance, it weighs down your ability to buy spares, um, and it hasn't been dealt with. And it's not going to be dealt with purely by giving Eskom these uh, annual amounts, uh, which are now look like they have to be in the system permanently unless a debt solution is found. So there's a lot. And then there's the PFMA, the, proc uh, the, the framework that procurement is conducted. And we hear a lot, Transnet raising similar concerns. It's not really fit for purpose. It's not helpful uh, that Eskom has to go out on a competitive tender and not use, for instance, their internal capacity uh, from one of their, <laughs> their, their own units. Um, uh, it's, it seems outrageous, but that's what uh, they're having to do. They have to go out and tender. They have to go with the cheapest quote when they actually want to go with uh, guys that they, they feel definitely can do the maintenance that are linked to the OEMs. So there's a whole lot of things that put them on the back foot. And uh, plus there's the whole tr energy transition that they're having to manage. And I think give thought to leadership, uh, which hasn't, there hasn't been any thought leadership on that out of Eskom until now. So there's so many balls in the air that the Eskom is management and leadership is on the back foot. And uh, that, that makes it very, very, very difficult. But I think that over-promise and under-delivery around maintenance is a, is a problem. Is the shareholder playing its part? Yes and no. So definitely the shareholder, including us as taxpayers, <laughs> is giving Eskom those annual bailout amounts to keep it a uh, going concern. So that's important. But it, it hasn't come with a financial uh, resolution to this debt problem. So, and that is really something the shareholder has to be uh, playing a role in. And uh, really putting Eskom, where once unbundled, um, in, in a position that it can be financially sustainable and can raise the debt it needs to build out the network, both the transmission and distribution network, and on the generation side, start replacing to its, uh, to its level best because it's, it's not going to be the only game in town. We're going to need lots of IPP capacity. But uh, to start bringing in w some of that new generation capacity beyond Madupi and Kosile, because that's, that's the last megawatts that Eskom has been bringing in. So uh, the shareholder, I think, needs to come to the party with a debt solution, which hangs over everything and makes it very, very difficult for uh, Eskom to escape this crisis. Is the policy and regulatory environment supportive of a speedy resolution to this crisis? Again, it's a mixed picture there. I think there has been movement at last on, on procurement of RPP power. Uh, uh, that took very long. I mean, we know we had the stall after bid window four. Those projects only after being procured all the way back in 2014 after being named as preferred bidders in 2015. Those projects only closed in 2018 and are only now entering into the system. Then we had this long period of review of the integrated resource plan and only started procuring again officially this, this year, first with the risk mitigation or the emergency uh, procurement program, which has now hit its own uh, brick wall in the form of litigation in the form of uh, environmental authorizations that haven't been received for certain of the projects. So that's been delayed um, in, an, uh, in a crisis. And then we've got the bid window five projects where there was a huge oversubscription, but we stuck, even though we're in a crisis of a uh, short of between four and 6,000 megawatts in terms of what Eskom says, um, we stuck with, uh, with only what buying just under 2,600 megawatts. There was probably a missed opportunity there to bring in more megawatts earlier. But at least there's been some movement. And there's also been the, the movement around the 100 megawatt reform, which allows distributed generation plant not only to build their own plant without a license, but also to wheel and sell to third parties. So that's an important development. But 
we don't really have resolution on the policy and the regulatory front that is satisfactory to ensure that we speedily ex exit this crisis. Um, the regulator is again in court with Eskom around its la latest tariff application. That's really not the sort of distraction we need in this current crisis. Um, uh, we don't yet have cost-reflective tariffs from the regulatory side, and we don't really have a regulatory framework that really frees up people to build rapidly uh, into the system. So no, we don't have a regulatory system that's really fit for purpose or responsive to the crisis. And on the policy front, we get so many mixed messages around coal and renewable energy all the time. We get criticism that seems unfounded from the uh, energy minister of the Eskom executive around delays to the risk mitigation project, which are clearly outside of its control. Uh, we have um, no clarity yet with the unbundling that has taken place internally with ESC, in, within Eskom is going to have the legislative and policy and regulatory support that it needs to actually be implemented for the transmission business by the end of the year. I mean, that's right now. Are we going to get there? I don't know. So there's so many uh, on the policy front uh, issues that are not sorted out on the regulatory front, whether the tariff, never mind the tariff framework, but having tariffs that, that allow for separation between energy and capacity charges are still not properly in place. So there's no, the, an the short answer is no, that we don't have the regulatory and uh, the policy support that's necessary to get us out of this crisis quickly. The 4,000 to 6,000 megawatt supply gap is also attracting renewed interest. Yes, I think Eskim has made sure that that is on the agenda, basically saying we can't maintain, we just don't have the, never mind the, the, the finance, but we don't have the space and time in the system to, to maintain this coal fleet, which is now very old, much of it over 40 years, and needs to be properly maintained, it needs to be off for 30 day maintenances or 60 day maintenance as per what the operating manual says, and they can't. I mean, we can really see now, this is the summer maintenance period. Eskim is maintaining less, as we speak, um, less than 5,000 megawatts of planned maintenance. Most of the plant is out, that is out, the nearly 50, for over 14,000 that's out currently is on unplanned or it's breakdowns that, um, that are in the system. So we need to have a focus on that. And reflecting back on the previous few questions, we just don't have the regulatory uh, policy uh, uh, frameworks to accelerate um, these processes at a, to a point where the capacity comes in much quicker uh, than is currently the case. We, even with bid window five, which as I said was delayed for so many years, those projects are only 36 months away before we start getting anything flowing into the network. So. Uh, there's a lot of focus on it, but there's not a lot of clear, urgent action being taken to start closing that gap. Thank you. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.